On this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Welcome to the Life Science Success Podcast. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Don. I'm a consultant in life sciences. I help companies manage complexity and increase performance. Today on the podcast, my guest is Steph- Stefan Lukanov. Stefan is the founder and CEO of Salve Th- Therapeutics, a biotech company in LA. They're building viral biologics with computational tools. So with that, welcome, Stefan. Hi, Don. Thanks very much for having me. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you. So uh, can you tell the listeners just a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I moved to LA to start this company uh, during COVID. And um, it, it kind of was generated from ideas that I had training at like Harvard, Pitt, UMaine, Hopkins, kind of 20 years of, of just researching and looking around for what's available. Um, and I, I love it so far. I think LA is a great place to be. The ecosystem is really, um, you know, developing nicely. It's very diverse. It's very kind of like creatively free. And um, originally from Massachusetts, so it's quite a difference culturally and, and weather-wise. But um, I think it's good because it puts me in a different mindset for, for the company's, you know, embryogenesis. Yeah, and I mean, I, I mean, I, I know of a lot of companies, both between Boston as well as San Francisco. Um, yeah. You know, is it primarily your your family roots being there that drew you there or anything else? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I fell in love with the city when I was eight years old, actually, because I came out here on a business trip with my dad and sister. Um, and we did a tour of like Los Angeles, Santa Cruz and San Francisco. Um, we, we have a branch of our family here. Um, we don't get to see them very often, obviously, but it made it a little bit easier to just settle down. And um, so I... I, I remember very distinctly coming to like Universal City at, as a boy and being like, wow, this, this feels different. Like the city feels like it has you know, a real pulse to it. So when I had some time and like no mortgage and no kids, I decided to just move here and start a company. And um, I think also because I, um, you know, I love Boston. I love training there. I still have like a lot of contacts. I still learn quite a bit from like the Harvard Biotech Club. Um, but being out here is just sort of like the, the newness of it and the relative openness of the biotech ecosystem makes it easier to be, um, kind of your own founder Mm. without worrying too much about like what others are doing, um, what big companies might be out there. I'd say the biggest one out here is probably Amgen and they're independently owned. Um, Takeda has a place in Glendale too, but, um, that's Amgen is one that kind of like stands out as like the iconic LA biotech company. So, um, yeah, happy to, happy to be in the city. It, it feels like um, really motivating to to get the venture off the ground here. And most actually, most small businesses own their own land in the city, so that's mm. quite kind of inspiring too. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine that a lot of a lot of smaller companies are probably renting space and things like that. So yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah, well, that that's actually the biggest problem. When I go to a lot of um, like founder or life science finance events out here space is always what's discussed most and it it is sort of i'd say the main bottleneck right now but there's enough good incubators that um you can sort of pair with them and then dovetail into reasonable um rental arrangements with local offices or lab space um so if you're really you know being a founder is hard anyways so if you're just willing to like focus on the space as part of your your um early stage I think you can find what you need pretty, pretty quickly with the right people. Yeah, absolutely. So coming out of school, what made you really want to be an entrepreneur? Uh, I didn't and nothing. It, kind of, it was actually an idea that, that the company got built around. I didn't so much want to be part of a company. Um, and I'm still sort of like worried a little bit. This might not be real <laughs> or, or it might not be possible, but I just kind of like pushed through those. Um, I, I mostly studied um, virology and biochemistry during my master's. So no, no coding, uh, no dry lab, um, nothing besides just like searching bioinformatic websites. And when I got out of Harvard in um, summer of 2019, I, I had an idea for like um, gene, ther- uh, gene therapy basically. 
um, targeting um, a rare type of brain cancer um, that uh, neighbor had actually. And a lot of gene therapy companies in Boston um, get spun out of very famous academic labs, which wasn't my case. And I, I sort of saw what they were doing and, and it's all very fascinating. A lot of them do apply like AI to their discovery sort of methodology. Um, but I also have a family that's like very steeped in an engineering background, you know, sort of proud Germano Slavs. And I knew of like CAD software, for example, from other engineering fields, so computer aided design and drafting. And I, I, you know, sitting in my Dorchester apartment during COVID and, you know, the general panic, I thought, well, if you just designed like a, like a BioCAD software suite for um, complex drugs, you could accelerate the R&D process that much faster through virtual prototyping. And it's not a novel idea because it exists in other engineering fields, but its application to biology is somewhat new. So it's kind of a, a borrowing from, from one field and applying to another. Um, and so I kind of, luckily the idea happened right around NVIDIA's GTC Fall 2020 conference. So I was able to, you know, attend those meetings and see what was out there for technology, especially in like the life science area. Um, and then being a GPU manufacturer, you know, biology is all geometry basically. So a lot of their technology is really applicable. And when I started asking questions at, you know, the, the lectures and meeting um, first like high performance computer manufacturers, mostly out here, like in Orange County, um, they all seemed really excited to showcase their technology for life science applications. Because, you know, now, now that we have, you know, clouds and, and HPC workstations that can, can process that sort of like light speed, you know, capabilities, we can finally run the simulations and modeling that are required for biology, which is, you know, a very complex stochastic system compared to inanimate um, matter. And that, that got me more excited because I've always liked computers. Um, and, and I think that was the kind of point where I was like, all right, maybe I should start a company about this because it, it seems like a more viable option for, for the ideas Genesis than, uh, you know, trying to bring it back into academia or, or just writing about it, basically. So I'd say that, that when I realized that computers fit the idea and there was like software ready to be made, that, that's kind of what motivated me to keep moving forward. So that, I mean, that leads me to the, the next question. I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about Solve Therapeutics and, and what are you working on there? What specifically, sure. you know, do, do you provide? Uh, so we're still early stage and still concept stage, but the, the main IP that we're working on right now, and we've paired with Braid Theory out of Los Angeles to do that, um, it's called VirChat, it's short for Virus Computer Aided Design. So it's a CAD style workflow following the central dogma of biology to build um, either modified or new viruses. And at first we focused on cell and gene therapies because uh, viruses kind of represented a way to make the permanent changes in patient genomes that you would need to cure, you know, really debilitating inherited diseases. But now we've shifted a bit more to um, potentially selling this, this software we would design through B2B SaaS to reagent and equipment manufacturers. So companies that don't make drugs, but they still make biologics, but they still make instrumentation that, you know, make biologics. And the reason for that is that the FDA regulation is a bit less strict. So you can use the software to, to sell these companies. They can build toolkits for basic research that can eventually be applied to therapeutics. Um, and you kind of like cut the technology's teeth and validate it before you actually bring it into um, an arena i.e. FDA regulation of cell engine therapies or, or whatever else, that is much more stringent and, and much more sort of um, legally and financially risky, frankly. You know, there, there are patient deaths that can knock company stock, you know, as big as Estellas, for example. So that, that's a real issue that we were concerned about. Um, <clears throat> so right now we're kind of bridged between San Diego and um, LA probably, because I, I go to a lot of conferences in San Diego to kind of do customer discovery you know, market the idea, see who's interested, try to get like corporate beta testers mostly, um, who would help us develop the product according to their specifications because they, they know what their workflow is and they know what they want to design. So we want to make sure that we make the software um, tailored to, to those needs, basically. Um, that's kind of what we've been working on most with Braid Theory, and it seems to be proving um, successful. And it also helps us reach beyond just LA because I think there's a lot of creative companies out there that are trying to combine computation and biology together into their like, you know, product development that, that like our idea 
and they see it sort of as like um kind of the same way we did it it's traditional but it's it's exciting because it's in a new area and it's like why why didn't this happen before you know yeah yeah and i mean i guess the the one thing that it brings me back to your education a little bit is that you uh in school you focused on biological chemistry and t tumor virology um yeah. are those things helping you as well with running the company and with yeah. developing the idea no for sure i'd say those are the sort of the, the brackets to the idea because for for the lab i was in for tumor virology was actually the one that discovered the capi uh, sorry kaposi sarcoma um, herpes virus um and they've also discovered other cancer causing viruses too so that that idea of like viral discovery from patient data um was sort of ingrained at that point and then um so that's kind of like um what the input material to the, the software development that can lead to new drugs or biologics the output so how, how do you run assays to test it how do you validate it how do you make sure like the virus that you designed virtually is actually um manifesting properly in nature um that's that's about chemistry parts so so what lab tests you perform you know what, what sort of cellular animal based models you run it on and so i think aside from the computation i kind of had like the wet lab input outputs already established in my head um and then i it, i was actually a terrible student like i i should have had my phd a long time ago but i kept reading the wall street journal and you know getting distracted basically so i i i think doing reading that and also having sort of access to resources to the harvard system gave me confidence to have a more corporate mindset early on and i've actually never really felt like a startup founder i felt more like a really an early stage corporation um my my co-founders are all sort of like mid-career professionals they're they're not um students for the most mm -hmm. part um they all we're international. We have a, a person in Vancouver. We have a person in Tehran. We've never met in person, but we've all worked on projects together. So I think from the start, we've always kind of had that mentality that um, we want to build a healthcare company um, eventually, or, or even just something. We'll see. We're still being creative about it. But but it, it's it's just it's exciting to think about it that way because there's sort of like not as much of the pressure as a startup, but but we still have sort of the the newness or, or the pioneering feel to it yeah yeah and i i mean i it's it's one of those things too that um you know i talked to a lot of organizations about scaling the organization and oftentimes when teams are super close whenever they get started they oftentimes yeah. don't have some of these remote struggles that you oftentimes start to start to run into the minute that you start to have you know bigger teams anyway so it sounds like you're having to overcome some of yeah. those in the early stages as well yeah, no, it's funny. I've, I've had a few <laughs> people talk about like funding rounds. I've had like co-founder rounds where I just, you know, kind of marketed the idea. People who were interested have, have joined on and they have contributed pretty significantly to like the website or customer list or, um, you know, presentations. And the team I have right now has been stable, I'd say, for almost a year, which I'm, I'm pretty proud about because um, it, we're almost like a, like a hand that's starting to act in concert with each other. Um, and it's cool too, because like, we, you know, we've, we've become friends too through it. Um, and I think that, you know, we're, we're starting to like advertise our working for Salve independent of our day jobs. Like I, I teach in LA to, to bootstrap. I, I, even if I had a billion dollars, I'd still teach cause it's just, you know, food for the soul <laughs> as opposed to this, which is just like, you know, kind of enterprise curiosity. But, um, I think, I think that also kind of contributes to our corporate mindset because we have an idea of like the world and the market beyond our idea beyond our products um and we think that it, you know with, with that sort of mindset we can better adapt whatever we make to to realities around us uh, you know whether it's COVID or, or a bank collapse or you know whatever it might be yeah yeah, it's. I mean, it, the, the statement that you made about teaching. I mean, I I definitely have that same bug as well, and um, you know, love love in general teaching and and spending time, you know, with people in general educating anyway. So um, at one point, I was I was a, a guilty educator and did both, uh, you know, in person as well as remote uh, education, and okay. um, you know, yeah. found myself, you know essentially teaching for three different schools. So uh, there oh, was a wow. point point that I had to back off as well. So yeah, I, 
I can feel your I can feel your want to to get out there and do that as well. Cool. So what do you see as some of the key opportunities for Salve? Um, yeah, I think um, a few. The, the main thing that we had funding wise planned was to submit an NSF STTR um, right off the bat. Uh, it's non-dilutive. Uh, big companies like Amgen, Illumina, um, Biogen, 23andMe are, have, are in their portfolio. So it's really prestigious for that reason. Um, it doesn't offer that much, but it does get you into the government system, which can sort of allow for other grants and other funding opportunities. Um, if you want to become a contractor, it's a great way to do that because but the process of like being forced to incorporate and get an address, you know, registered and get your UEI with SAM.gov, that took most of the grant time. You know, the, the grant itself took me a few days to write. It was the registration process to like show like I'm not fake, I'm real. That was um pretty, pretty strenuous, but we just got that out on, I think Monday. Yeah. Monday night. So like two years of work culminated finally. And I, it went from being just like, um, me to now, you know, five co-founders, including myself, two advisors and potentially a contracting team that that'll contract for equity. So I think, I think the, the idea has like, enough strength to carry itself with people who understand its value. Um, so besides the STTR, I'd say like the customer traction we're gaining from the conferences that we've been going to in the trade shows is, is pretty cool too, because um, it shows that there's something lacking in the, the companies developing biologics as we predicted. So, it, you know, there, there is a market and they just didn't know about it. Um, we don't want to claim to be like the iPhone of viral design. That'd be ridiculous. But like, um, it's just cool to see that like people might actually help us build it even as early as beta testing, um, which, which is just like, you know, hugely validating. And then I think, um, you know, in, in terms of like wider economics, we, we definitely want to help bring down prices. You know, the, the benefits of automation and industrialization has been just that to, you know, re reduce the cost of manufacturing goods that are critical for human life, really. And yeah, you, you remove some of like the artisanal personality to things, but you know, that's not what a patient wants. That's not what, you know, somebody who has um, a rare brain cancer or, or you know, a debilitating you know, bacterial infection wants. They want a solution quickly because, you know, it's their life. So I think, and they want it for, you know, not, not their mortgage. Um, so I think that yeah. in the same way that like tech has reduced the price of genome sequencing to, to like cents, you know, per, per base pair, um, we can do the same thing for biologics. And there, there has been some pushback when I've talked to certain consultants in biotech that they want to label us a tech company because if we say we're a biotech company, we're automatically a better competitor by having a tech background. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's actually been sort of promising too because it shows we're a market disruptor early on. Yeah, and I mean, that, wouldn't it be nice to have, a, have lower cost biologics because the you know, the path to bring them to market is maybe, maybe refined in silico and then, and then brought, brought to bear. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, I think you don't have to go through policy all the time to do it, which can be like controversial and, and difficult to get across. And you always have like people resisting it. Technology seems like very sort of policy agnostic, you know, there's, there's the old way of doing things and there's a more advanced and capable and efficient way of doing things. Um, I think stem cells are a good example of that, where you had an ethical quagmire that was solved by a new technology um, that kind of, you know, just made it a moot point. And I think that can happen here too. Yeah. And then what are some of the biggest challenges that you have right now? Yeah. Um, I would, sometimes, you know, we, I don't want to get too specific, but, um, we get a little bit ahead of ourselves in terms of like our funding strategy to remain non-dilutive and um, low cost. So we we recently joined an incubator that didn't really work out too well. And it wasn't for the virus project, it was for sort of a simpler IP that we want to develop as a revenue generator. Um, we're still moving forward with that IP because we have rights to it, but our, our relationship with the incubator has since fallen apart and, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen next. I don't really want to talk about it too much, but that that's been a challenge because 
when when you have IP constraints such as um, from developing IP with the university or, or another nonprofit, and, and it's divided so you don't have like complete inventor rights over it, um, it can really tie your hands in terms of like the the development tracks possible for that IP. So like with the virus stuff, that's ours, and we can do what we want with it in terms of development. And it's a much bigger project too, so we kind of have to keep it close to to the chest. For this app idea, it's it's been tremendously frustrating because you know this is sort of part of our funding strategy. It's not the only thing, thank God, mm -hmm. but um, to have sort of like roadblocks put up for what we see as artificial reasons um, is a is a good learning experience, I guess, um, yeah. for for a startup. But it's also um, it shows that not everybody's on your side, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, so I, I don't know your situation, so I'm going to, I'm going to provide a little bit of comment here just based on, or based from a, a sideline standpoint, you can either confirm or, or not, you know, along the way, but I mean, here's kind of what I've seen in a few cases. Now, one, I've seen some of the, whoever the original IP owner was university or, you know, other academic, mm -hmm. you know, institution or, you know, maybe just an outside institution that that has it and wanted to sell it. Um, you know, now they're sitting on the sidelines, but then they control so much in terms of like where you yeah. can do do different things, where you can um, you know take take it next to bring it to market, and your whole idea just might be in yeah. jeopardy because you could have you know let's just take drugs for an example. Let's say that I have a really low cost lab that I could go do this in. And it's not yep. one that's associated with the academic institution that may offend them. And, and that's just my sideline view. It's like, you know, really, you can't, you can't do that. Uh, yeah, you have to no, go back to their lab. Sure. So, yeah. And, and it's funny. Cause like when I, when I explain sort of the IP scheme to new inventors or new scientists or new business people who might've come from mm -hmm. other countries, you know, where they, they don't know IP as well as we do. And I say like, oh, if you invent something at a university, it's not actually yours, it's the university's. They'll say, wait, what? Like, that doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> and it doesn't. Like, I mean, it, because the university provides relatively few resources to even get the idea off the ground. It's just sort of a, a space you're in. Um, and okay, it's great to have the brand name. I mean, it's also great to have Jordans, but you're not going to become Jordan from having like Jordans on. And I don't think that's the case with universities either. So um, it would really behoove them, and, and it, it depends on the region the school is in. So I've heard the Midwest and the South are way more venture friendly than um, the, the coasts, frankly. So I think I think if you want to really have creative control over, you know, your brain children, you, you have to pick your market wisely and your partners wisely too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, just understanding all aspects of it. And I, and I oftentimes encourage people on the venture capital side, the same exact thing. It's like, you know, yeah. if, if, if in your venture capital pitch, if they didn't focus at all on the science and they were solely focused on the path to market, then that's right. where their path, that's where their focus is going to be throughout the, your entire time dealing with them. So yeah. they, they're sure. not going to dive into the science. They're not going to really, you know, understand that. Um, which is kind of a, it's both a risk for the VC, but it's also a risk for the company that's, that's asking for the funding as well. Yeah, no. And we, we've been aware of that because um, for example, with, with viral gene therapy, there's kind of a pushback at the NIH right now against it because it, it represents something dangerous. And that's true. Like, you know, if a virus gets out of control, it can very quickly, you know, lead to something we've had, for example, now. And so I think that that's kind of like force us to think about solutions regulatory and otherwise to prevent that from happening. So um, how do we how do we make sure that we build safeguards into viruses that we design? Do we make antivirals alongside those viruses as sort of like kill switches that we can implement quickly in case there is an outbreak? Um, can we convince customers and patients that it's it's worth the risk if your life's already on the line, you know, for from, from a disease that you were born with or acquired? Um, to try a uh, more controversial, risky therapy. And I think that once you have sort of that um, public groundswell, eventually the regulatory agencies comply because, you know, they're, they're sort of secondary to that public. Yeah. Well, Stefan, there are three questions that I like to ask every guest. What inspires you? 
What inspires me? Uh, G.I. Joe. I gave this on another podcast. Um, <laughs> so they, they had a story arc in the early 80s where they created uh, an emperor supervillain called Serpentor from the DNA of historical villains and conquerors. So I, I didn't want to make a supervillain, but I, I was curious about the power of DNA again at an early age. Um, I'd say Francis Crick. Uh, he was really a visionary. Um, you know, he, he built underwater mines during World War II and then became sort of like the molecular biologist alongside Jim Watson. So I think that um, it's, it's good to know sort of like whose shoulders you're standing on, obviously. Um, and then um, it's going to sound maybe strange, but th there was this German mystic <laughs> named Hildegard of Bingen in, I think, the 12th or 13th century. Um, in, 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 she was a polymath, you know, she's one of the first sort of like female Catholic astronomers and, and also an abbess. And when you when you think about like, I guess, you know, what was possible for, for women back then and, and just scientifically in general, it's actually quite astounding what she accomplished with the limitations that she had and with pushback from like a major institution at the time. So um, we don't presume to be mystics, but we have a similar sort of, I guess, experience currently. I don't think I've ever had anybody answer that question that way. I've been doing this show for like two years. Nobody started with GI Joe and and did oh, that's myth, great. Yeah. mystic. So that's just use way, that clip. Kind of. Ignore go. everything else. Just use right. that clip. What concerns you? Um. Yeah, viruses being dangerous. Honestly, I I'm, I am aware of how risky this project is. You know, you can't just use any virus in any situation. But I think that's the gift of technology too. Is that if you have an indication with in a tissue with viruses already evolved to it, why not use those as sort of the, the, the buoys for the treatment too? Um, and with like, you know, recombinant engineering that we have right now, it's not difficult to engineer safety into those same sort of like evolved suite of, of options. Yeah, that's a great answer for, especially given your space and what we've already been through with COVID as well. Sure. What excites you? What excites me? Um, I think the Boston Celtics probably, and that's that's dangerous in LA, I suppose. But um, I've heard they respected Larry Bird quite a bit, or respect him. Um, and so they're, they're, when I wear a Celtics hat, you know, to like events or something, I don't I don't really get in the uh, trash talk. So that's pretty cool. All right. Well, Stefan, thank you so much for being on the Life Science Success Podcast. And thanks so, so much for sharing with us, you know, all your ideas and your progress with, with regards to Salve. Great. Thanks, Don. Thanks to my team, too, for helping us get here. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast, or tell a friend about it. And last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. Thank you.